Welcome to Plodcast, episode 49. We're almost to 50. If, in case you hadn't noticed, 49 is near to 50. So, here we are, episode uh, 49 in our Plodcast. I want to begin by talking about the American and French revolutions. Um, a lot of our controversies have to do with um, our relationship as Christians to the civil government, and uh, our civil governments are increasingly tyrannical. And because our governments are increasingly tyrannical, some uh, Christians are talking about wh- where does our duty to resist kick in? What should what should we do? How should we respond? And um, also, the fact that many Christians have gotten involved in homeschooling and starting Christian schools, uh, when you do that, you have to teach history, and you have to teach, his, uh, you have to uh, tell the kids, was this good, what they did? You know, when you have the kids reading their Bibles, and it's, it says in Romans 13, not to, re- not to resist the established authority, uh, and then people say, well, wasn't the American Revolution a resistance of established authority? Uh, was that, was George Washington sinning. You can't say, well, no, he wasn't sinning because he's an American hero. You have to have a biblical answer to this. Um, And I I think that we cannot have a biblical answer to it unless we see the American war for independence, as I prefer to call it, in its context. So I I think we have to understand that the 18th, uh, excuse me, the 19th century, the 1800s, was a century of revolutions. It was a revolutionary era. And I, would, I want to argue that this revolutionary era was kicked off not by the American Revolution in 1776, but rather by the French Revolution in the 1790s. So I think the first pure revolution that happened was the French Revolution. And then uh, there were various revolutions that unfolded, uh, increasing the power of the centralized state down through the 1800s, and then the the, sort of the mother of them all, the Russian Revolution in the early 20th century. So uh, the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution were like two evil bookends um, encompassing a century of revolutions. But there's, there are some marked differences between the American and French Revolution. Some, there are some who want to uh, just lump the American and French Revolutions together. Um, there were trace elements of what later surfaced in the uh, French Revolution in the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson was initially friendly to the French Revolution. Uh, Thomas Paine was very much a radical in the, uh, in the, in the stripe of the uh, the French revolutionaries. But for the most part, the Americans were conservatives. They were constitutional conservatives. When the French Revolution happened, they leveled their old order. They, uh, they executed the king. They um, executed numerous aristocrats. They tried to change, they, they attempted to change the calendar. They tried to uh, uh, exterminate the Christian religion. They um, established a 10-day week trying to get away from the Christian seven-day week. And, you know, it was a, it was a radical project where they, they wanted to eliminate uh, the old order. And that old order absolutely included Christendom. In contrast, the Americans, if someone were uh, a resident of Maryland or Virginia or Massachusetts, and he took up arms in order to go fight for independence. He was fighting under the government that he grew up under. He wasn't trying to overthrow the established order. The established order was seeking independence from England, and they had every constitutional right to do so, and here's why. In the uh, the development of English constitutional liberties in the 1600s, uh, well, the, it goes back to the Magna Carta, but uh, one of the one of the tension points uh, in English law was the tension between the king and parliament. Now, uh, it's a long story, but in the in the English Civil War, that ended in the 1640s. That ended with Charles I having his head chopped off, 
and um, and by Oliver Cromwell and the forces of Parliament. Basically, war broke out between Parliament and the Crown. And earlier than that, let, let's say a century before, in the uh, uh, in the fifteen hundreds, the Crown, the monarchy, had this had the strong position over against Parliament. Parliament was weaker. The crown was stronger. In the 1640s, Charles the First, Charles the First, had his head chopped off, and then after Cromwell died, his son Richard wasn't able to hold together. The restoration happened. Charles the Second was brought back and established as the monarch. After Charles the Second died, his brother James the Second was um, uh, crowned king. And he was a bigoted Catholic and tried, wanted to bring Catholicism back, which wasn't going to happen, and not very competent. And so there was what was called the Glorious Revolution in 1688. William and Mary were brought in, put on the throne. So twice within a generation, in the 1640s and the late 1680s, twice uh, a monarch had been deposed, one by execution and the other was uh, by exile. Uh, and Parliament, as a result, Parliament uh, had the strong assumed the strong position. So, um, in the 1500s, the monarch would have been over uh, in a position of strength over against the uh, uh, Parliament. By the by, the opening years of the 1700s, it was the other way around in England. But here's the here's the uh, quirk that you have to remember. During this time. Uh, the colonies were being settled. So, um, you know, there was uh, uh, 1620 was uh, Plymouth Rock. You had, uh, uh, and then uh, by the late 1600s and the early 1700s, you had hundreds of thousands of people going from the British Isles over to America. Um, in that time period, early 1700s, uh, late 1600s, over 600,000 Scots and Scots-Irish uh, traveled to America. Okay, so when they traveled, when they established their colonies in America, they, um, they had an executive who was a royal, they, they were established by charter. And these charters would, it gave them the right to have their own legislatures, their own parliaments. And there was uh, frequently a royal governor, so the executive was the king back in England, and he had a uh, he had a representative on the ground in the colony, in the royal governor. So, they were minding the the colonists were minding their own business, and uh, you know conducting their own affairs, etc. And they had their own legislatures, and they and they dutifully. Um, responded to the authority of the king as represented in the royal governor. Now, back in England, when the king was sort of taken down a few pegs and Parliament assumed the strong hand over the king, Parliament assumed that that put them in the position of have, being in charge of the colonies. The king used to be the executive for the colonies. Now the king is not so hot anymore here in England and we're going to uh, tell the colonies what to do. And so the first great um, clash was in the stamp with the Stamp Act and where Parliament levied a tax on the colonies. In order for you to understand the magnitude of this, and it wasn't the magnitude wasn't the amount of the tax. It wasn't the it wasn't how much money it was. It was who was levying the tax. You would, how would you react if you got a tax bill? Let's say you live in Iowa and you received a tax bill one day levied on you by the legislature of Florida. Florida just said, Hey, uh, we're going to tax your lawnmower. We're going to, or we're going to tax your, um, you know, things that you were doing in Iowa within the borders of Iowa, and that's all you were doing. We're going to tax that. I, I hope that you would look at this tax bill from the legislature of Florida, wad it up, and round file it. The legislature of Florida has absolutely nothing to say to you. You've got your own governor. You've got your own legislature. Everything's in order. And it wouldn't help 
if you said if they said, well, we've had sort of a political upheaval here down in Florida, and because of this political upheaval in Florida, that means that we have the right to tax you. You would say, no, you don't. Um, if you want your tax money, come and get it. That that was the situation that happened. Um, the American colonies had their own legislatures by charter. When Parliament attempted to tax the colonies and the colonists had no representatives in Parliament, um, this move is what, what you might want to call illegal. It was, it, was, it was unconstitutional. It was illegal. The colonists had every constitutional right to kick. Now, there are some other differences, but I, I will... Our time is up. Time's, uh, time's winged chariot is at our back. I'm currently enjoying Talib's um, uh, latest book called Skin in the Game, and I would like to commend it to you. His earlier books, uh, he, he has an earlier book that I really enjoyed, Black Swan, um, and then his uh, subsequent book, Anti-Fragile, uh, is also very good. I'm um, currently in the middle of um, Skin in the Game, and I think I like it the best of all of them. Maybe it's, it's I like them all, but maybe Black Swan, maybe Skin in the Game. Skin in the Game is uh, really a good book. Um, his argument uh, it, here is that um, information doesn't make you wise. Skin in the Game makes you wise. Information without skin in the game makes you stupid. Information, mere data, without having a, an element of risk of your own in it, makes you foolish, makes you stupid. So, um, for example, he, uh, uh, he argues that you ought not to buy and sell. Uh, if you're, if you're a, in the stock market, you ought not to buy and sell when your stockbroker tells you to buy and sell, you should do what your broker is doing, not what your broker is saying. You, um, if, if someone says, hey, I, I, I'm going to uh, give you uh, some free advice, uh, Talib would, would almost certainly say, don't pay any attention to advice. If someone's wise, follow him and copy what he's doing. Learn what he's doing. Um, learn what he is willing to risk his money on. Um, if someone has no skin in the game, they can tell you. Basically, a lot of the problems in the world are caused by people who do not, who do not have to face any consequences for being wrong. If you have a hundred thousand dollars and a theory of the stock market, and you invest all of that money based on your theory of the stock market, and you lose all your money. You had skin in the game, and you come away from that episode hopefully a little bit wiser. If you're a broker and, and uh, someone comes in and asks for advice on what they should do with their $100,000, and you visit with them for half an hour, and you tell them to go do X, Y, Z, and they do it, and they lose $100,000, for them, that was $100,000. That might be their life savings. For the broker, that was a half-hour conversation. He doesn't have he doesn't have skin in the game. Um, now, risk. Uh, so, uh, Talib is arguing that risk is not only a, a good thing; it is a necessary good thing. It is really a good thing, and and we should covet it. We should pursue it. We should embrace it. We should not resent it. We should not try to structure our lives in such a way that. Um, uh, we are buffered from the consequences of our choices. You want to live in such a way that when you make a wise choice, you reap the benefit. When you make a foolish choice, you want the consequences to rain down upon your head. That is the way of wisdom. So, Episode 49 podcast. Here we are. Here, here, here we still are. So um, uh, we've been looking at hamartia and hamartano for the last few weeks. Uh, there are many uses in Scripture, and so we've had to spread it out over a number of weeks. Uh, 
sin is obviously one of the great themes of the book of Romans, and the word hamartia occurs 48 times in this book. The word sin, it's almost like you, you think that Paul's trying to fix a problem. <laughs> right? um, Jews and Gentiles are both of them under sin, which Paul has proven uh, in 3.9. Um, so Gentiles are under sin in chapter 1, Jews are under sin in chapter 2, they're both under sin in chapter 3. So in 3.9, both of them are under sin. No one shall be justified by the deeds of the law, because the law brings knowledge of sin. That's in 3.20. This being the case, the man whose sins are covered is blessed indeed. That's in 4.7. The man to whom God does not impute sin is also blessed. That's in 4.8. Adam brought sin into the world, and death by sin, because all sinned. That's in 5.12. Sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not imputed apart from the law. 5.13. Where sin abounded, which was planet Earth, grace abounded all the more. That's in 5.20. And as sin reigned unto death, so grace reigns to life. Uh, That's in 5.21. All right, so... Shall we then sin that grace may abound? 6.1. Not a bit of it. How can we who are dead to sin still live in it? 6.2. We died with Christ so that the body of sin might be destroyed, so that we would not serve sin. 6.6. A man who is dead is freed from sin. 6.7. Christ died to sin once. Uh, Christ died to sin once. 6.10. We should therefore reckon ourselves dead to sin in a similar way. 6.11. We must not allow sin to reign in our bodies. 6.12. Neither should we yield our members as instruments to sin. 6.13. Sin is not to have dominion over us. 6.14. Because we are under grace, not law. You are slaves to the one you obey, and if you obey sin, you're the slave of it. 6.16. But we used to be slaves to sin, but now we've been set free. 6.17. Set free from sin, we are servants of righteousness, 618. You can see this section of chapter 6 is clustered with many uses. When we were slaves of sin, we were set free from righteousness. That's in 620. We have now been set free from sin, 622, and the wages of sin are death. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sin brought us to death, 75. Does this make the law sin, 77? Not at all. Paul would not have known what sin was apart from it, 7-7. Sin took advantage of the commandment, using it to create lust, 7-8. Apart from the law, sin is dead, 7-8. Sin revived when the law came and Paul died, 7-9. Sin used the commandment as an occasion for deception, 7-11. Sin, in order to appear as sin, worked death through a good instrument in order to become really sinful, 7-13. In this condition, Paul was sold under sin, 714. Trapped in this way, he isn't doing it, but the sin is the one doing it, 717. He repeats that point again, sin is the one doing it, 720. The law of sin is in his members and holds him captive, 723. Whatever he might do with his mind, with his flesh, he serves the law of sin, 725. But the law of the spirit of life liberated him from the law of sin, 82. Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's the first part of 8.3. This was done for sin, the second part of 8.3. And so God, uh, so God condemns sin in the flesh the, um, in the third part of 8.3. So all those references are in the same verse, verse 3. The bodies of Christians still die because of sin, 8.10. This is the fulfillment of God's goodness because God's covenant was that he would take away sins. 1127. As Christians, we must live in the light of this liberation, even in the details of life, because whatever is not from faith is sin. 1423. Uh, and you can see from this overview, I mean, I mean, to, for sin to be mentioned 48 times in the book, and the overwhelming number of them in the first eight chapters tells you that he is engaged um, in reasoning very closely with the wrestling very closely with the problem of sin, because that is the problem that the gospel addresses. God in the time of the sickness, God in the dark.
You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.